All right, I think we'll go ahead and start because I know Andrew will have a lot of really good things to say. We don't want to miss out. Um, so I'm really happy to welcome everyone today to our ongoing seminar series for the Lee Kumshin Center for Health and Happiness. We have as our speaker today, Dr. Andrew Steptoe, who is the head of the Department of Behavioral Science and Health at University College London. He's also the director of the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is no small task. He is former president of the International Society of Behavioral Medicine, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, the British Psychological Society, and too many other organizations to um, count. He's author and editor of 20 books, including the Handbook of Behavioral Medicine in 2010, the International Handbook of Psychosocial Epidemiology. I think you might have coined the phrase psychosocial epidemiology, actually, uh, in 2018. Research interests include psychosocial aspects of aging, links between mental and physical health, childhood obesity, health behavior change, and psychobiology of stress. And I, I really will say that Dr. Steptoe is kind of a pioneer in this field, um, a huge leader, and he's also a co-leader of the summer short course that the center offers on emotional well-being and physical health in partnership with the University College of London. So if people like this talk, take a look at the summer short course. <laughs> And he's also an advisory board member for the center. So we are really excited to have him take his time today to share a seminar with us. He's going to present on loneliness, well-being, and resilience during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So very timely. Um, and this is part of our 2021-2022 seminar series organized on the theme of recovery and resilience. And just on the logistics, um, I am going to manage the chat. So if you guys have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will try to keep track and then um, put them to Andrew when uh, the time timing seems appropriate. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, I will try and share my screen. Um, does that come up all right? Terrific. Well, thanks very much, Laura, for that kind introduction. And um, I've seen already seen uh, uh, names of several old friends uh, among the participants. So I'm sorry not to be there in person, um, but uh, it's nice to be able to talk to you uh, today about these issues and particularly um, the issue of well-being around the COVID pandemic. I should I should start with a, an apology, really, because you can see the title said loneliness, well-being, resilience during and after the COVID pandemic. And that was sort of written kind of assuming the COVID pandemic was over, but it obviously isn't. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm not really saying much about after. So, um, as you know, your country and my country are competing with each other about how many cases they have. Uh, these are, you know, fairly recent data from Johns Hopkins uh, showing that the United Kingdom is doing even worse than the US. You should be delighted by that in terms of uh, confirmed cases, but that there's no real sign of you know, the end of the pandemic at the moment. It may be going up and down, but um, uh, it's certainly still quite far up. And you know, sadly, there are uh, quite a number of uh, deaths still taking place as well. So the, I don't have any data about what's happened after the pandemic, so can't speak to that, but we'll try and tell you something about the work we've been doing on these issues uh, during the COVID pandemic. And what I'm hoping to talk about are these, uh, these things here. Um, I may not get round to the last one, we'll see, see how we, we go, but really to try to uh, tell you something about the work we've been doing on psychological well-being during the pandemic uh, and uh, resilience and living a worthwhile life and those, the impact that has on people's morale uh, during the pandemic period. <clears throat> so let me start by reminding you what you'll all be aware of, that there are a number of challenges that we've all faced during the pandemic, some of which are to do with the infection per se, that is our worry about getting the infection in ourselves or in our loved ones and uh, the definite uh, uh, cases which uh, happen uh, right across the population. And also challenges related to the mitigation actions, the actions that different societies have taken to try to uh, deal with the pandemic. Uh, and these include, uh, in many countries, uh, we call it social distancing. I think you call it kind of stay at home or shelter in place orders, which have obviously been very prominent feature uh, in many countries and, and still are now. Um, 
uh, as you, some of you may know, the country Austria now is banning anyone who is not doubly vaccinated from going outside at all. Um, so they're being very strict in terms of trying to um, reduce infection by social distancing activities. And those mitigation actions such as um, stay at home obviously have an impact on things like work, financial security, and also access to various things such as provisions, healthcare, the whole question of how you deal with uh, children and schooling, a whole series of issues that are uh, very relevant here. I'm going to be focusing particularly on two studies that uh, our group have been involved with. And so I'll just explain the first of these, um, which is a study that we started just around the time when the pandemic was really taking off in the UK in March 2020. Uh, and it's an internet study, uh, as many of these other kind of new ad hoc studies are. Uh, it, it started with weekly assessments and then over the summer of 2020, it moved on to monthly assessments. Um, the, the person who's really been inspiring this is my colleague, Daisy Fancourt. Um, and it's been used quite a lot in the UK for uh, issues surrounding confidence in government, whether or not people are following government recommendations and all that sort of thing, and has uh, a big focus on mental health. And it also has quite a large sample as well. Around 70,000 people have taken part in this over time. This slide here shows you uh, a kind of uh, summary of the major sources of stress that we've been uh, looking at. Uh, we've been asking people about uh, how much they are stressed by different things. And the orange uh, line here is being stressed by COVID itself. But then I've also put down on this slide, unemployment, financial issues, and getting food. So the horizontal axis starts in 23rd March, 2020, and goes through till the 6th of September, 2021. Uh, and the dotted lines, you needn't worry too much about, they're particular things which happened in the UK, where we had lockdowns uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, then we had uh, further lockdowns in during the winter, um, 2021. Um, and so those dotted lines indicate when these things started and uh, when they stopped as well. Um, but um, it uh, gives you a general idea of the sort of profile of the experience. And what you can see is that the worries, the stresses tended to be highest right at the beginning and then came down particularly over the summer of 2020. But then uh, during the winter months, when we did have another wave of infection, uh, there was particularly more worry about uh, COVID itself um, during that period, October, November, December, and then went down again um, later on and has remained at a lower level, even though we've had uh, quite a big jump in COVID rates uh, in June, uh, July and August this year. So it's not uh, a straightforward association with the levels of infection. Financial concerns have also oscillated, uh, but uh, were particularly high during those periods of, uh, of lockdown and have been present on average in about 30% of the, of the population that we've been looking at. We've also been looking at uh, positive well-being during this whole period, um, looking at uh, different markers. And one we've used quite a lot are the um, simple measures of happiness, life satisfaction, <clears throat> doing worthwhile things in life, um, which were devised by the Office for National Statistics in this country and have been used in national surveys since about 2012. So we have quite a lot of evidence on these. It's a simple rating of how happy you were yesterday um, so it's not dissimilar to what the Gallup and other organizations have done. So it uh, ranges from zero to 10, um, with 10 being higher scores of happiness and so forth. And what you can see are the levels I put here for men, uh, adult men and women over the uh, whole uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic period, um, <clears throat> with uh, quite low happiness levels at the beginning of the pandemic. Just for reference, I should say that the scores on this would typically be around 7.2, 7.5. So these are all much lower scores than we've had in previous years. But the, <clears throat> these indicators of positive well-being have increased during the summer of 2020, then got worse again during the winter, and then increased again uh, over the, uh, the last uh, several months. And a similar sort of pattern, you can see here with life satisfaction measures, Again, um, the horizontal axis is the same. The, I've divided out the population here by household income into um, 
based around the kind of average, which is £30,000 a year. So the orange are the people uh, with uh, lower income and the blue on my screen here are the people with higher income. So overall, the higher income people are reporting more life satisfaction um, and um, the, uh, but the levels have been fluctuating, um, uh, improving over the summer of 2020, then deteriorating over the winter and then uh, uh, going up again uh, afterwards. So this sort of pattern of, of things being worse right at the beginning of the pandemic is really something which has been seen in quite a number of studies, particularly studies of mental health. And uh, an example of that is the, um, the USC study um, run by Ad Captain and others, which uh, some of you will be familiar with, um, which has used the PHQ-4 uh, to assess psychological distress. And this particular slide runs from um, uh, March 2020 up until um, early on in 2021. Um, but really to highlight the fact that the rates were seemed to be higher during the early part of the pandemic, this particular slide is divided out by age category. And um, what it shows is that younger people had higher levels of um, psychological distress uh, than the older people but the overall pattern is uh, relatively uh, similar. When we come to loneliness, it uh, seems to be slightly different as far as we're concerned, uh, in that there hasn't been nearly so much fluctuation. This uh, slide here shows results again from our COVID-19 social study um, over the last um, 18 months using the UCLA short uh, form of loneliness, which um, the way we scored it, three is the lowest and nine is the highest. So all these scores are moderate, uh, but um, in slightly higher than you'd expect um, otherwise, but um, are not, haven't shown huge fluctuations with variations in what's been going on during the pandemic. But again, loneliness is greater among uh, less well-off uh, people. But a rather different sort of, uh, a more stable pattern, if you like, than we saw in some other things. Now, these are um, ad hoc studies. And so the advantage, of course, they have very rapid mobilization. Uh, they're inexpensive and we can do repeat assessments quite quickly and we can look at trajectories. But they are internet-based studies. And so the issue of representativeness comes up um, and uh, you know the extent to which the sort of people who um, complete this study are really similar to the rest of the population. Uh, they tend to be somewhat uh, uh, more affluent. We've used weightings to uh, national uh, survey levels. And what we have done, been able to do is to show that at least some of the patterns of correlates are very similar to what we'd see in uh, more representative samples. And that's illustrated uh, in this slide here, uh, which is an analysis we published last year comparing our study, the UCL COVID-19 social study on the right-hand side here, and the UK household longitudinal study, which is a large um, monthly population study going for many years, which has people of all ages. And um, so what I wanted to highlight is the fact that the relationships are between loneliness and these other factors are very similar in the two. Here, for example, we have uh, 60 plus of the reference group, and these are people who are uh, aged 46 to 59, then people in their 30s, and then younger adults. The loneliness levels are higher in both studies in the younger adults. The loneliness levels are higher in women than men, higher in uh, non-white ethnic groups than in white ethnic groups. Uh, they're related to education, so that uh, the loneliness levels are higher in the medium and low compared with highly educated groups. Uh, they're related to income as well, as I've shown already. They're related to employment, so employed people tend to have lower uh, um, loneliness levels than others, and uh, living alone is an important characteristic as well. So there seems to be quite similar sort of profiles. But the other problem with these kind of studies is they don't have any pre-pandemic levels, so they don't really have any reference levels, and so that makes it difficult to know whether they're genuinely showing increases during the pandemic or, or not. Um, some studies have tried to deal with this by getting people to do retrospective uh, measures. And this is an illustration of a study published a few months ago, uh, which I put there because it's quite a large study. It's a study of, you can see, around 16,000 people. It's an internet-based study. 
Uh, and it's an international study involving several countries, though um, about 40% of the data came from the uh, US and about 20% came from the UK and Ireland. And what, this, uh, what the investigators did was to um, ask people to complete the UCLA short form and then also um, to complete it as they felt at that moment and then how they felt before the pandemic. And so by this, they were able to uh, argue that there'd been large increases in the proportion of people um, who were lonely. So for example, the people with no loneliness were said to be 80% before down to about 55% uh, during. But that is uh, retrospective and you know we don't really know, people may be uh, um, making retrospective judgments which could be biased and so um, have uh, um, that could be an issue. So the stronger data, um, I would say, and I would say because I run one of the longitudinal studies, is to use existing longitudinal studies because there we have a known representative sampling frame, we have population representative data, uh, we have pre-pandemic measures, and of course we have all sorts of other information about people. So we've been looking at this in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, uh, which for those of you who don't know is a representative sample of men and women aged 50 and older living in England, right across the country. Um, their average age is about 66, 67, but they range from 50 to over 100. The um, study started in 2002 and people are reassessed every two years. There's a refreshment process which goes on as in the health and retirement study so that we keep a <clears throat> profile of younger people as the whole population ages. Um, and we'd done a wave of data collection in 2018-19, and then the COVID pandemic came along. And so we did two waves of data assessment um, during 2020, one fairly early on in the pandemic in June and July, and the next one in uh, November and December. And what was a little bit different in this study compared with some others is that we had a very high response rate. A lot of the longitudinal studies have actually not done terribly well. The UK household longitudinal study response rate is about 35%. Ours was pretty good, I think, partly because we were using telephone assessments of those people who couldn't complete this online. Well, the primary thing that we had looked at originally was mental ill health, which I'm not going to talk about now, but just show you uh, what the pattern is. So I put four variables on this slide. Uh, and there are three data points. Uh, one is before COVID-19, so that's the previous wave of data assessment. <clears throat> and then this is early in the pandemic and later in the pandemic uh, for depression, loneliness, poor quality of life and anxiety, which was not measured pre-pandemic. So there are only two data points there. And what's striking is that there are indeed increases in uh, these negative states, so much higher levels of depression, uh, more loneliness, uh, poorer quality of life, but that we didn't see this kind of diminution of response later in the year. If anything, the uh, rates of distress uh, increased between June and July and later in the year. And it's possible that what has been seen in some of the other studies is a kind of um, early um, improvement during the summer of 2020 when everybody thought, this whole thing would be over with and would be dealt with uh, pretty quickly. But by the time we saw people again in November, December, um, it was realized that this was a long-term, a more serious problem. And so the psychological distress was maintained at a higher rate and loneliness as well. So this kind of pattern is good, but again, it doesn't completely solve some of the methodological points. And one that you might think of is we don't know what the counterfactual is. We don't know what the levels of depression would have been if there hadn't been a pandemic, because all we've got is one pre-pandemic score. And perhaps, for example, there was an upward trend in distress anyway in the sample, and that this is just a reflection of that. So what we've done actually is to have a look uh, retrospectively over several years to see what the profile is. And I'm just showing you one example, which is for depression here. Um, and uh, so these are, this is the proportion of people who score uh, above threshold on the, the CESD, um, just as a way of, uh, of uh, presenting the data. So the blue lines here, <clears throat> blue bars are the data from previous years going down to the previous 10 years before the pandemic. And you can see the levels around 15, 18%. <clears throat> if anything, there seems to be a slight downward trend over the last few years. And then suddenly during the pandemic period, 
earlier and later, it's much increased. So I think we can argue that this is a genuine change. It's not just a, a trend, uh, a kind of secular trend, you might say. And we found the same thing looking at our measures of positive well-being as well. On the top left is uh, life satisfaction for the previous um, three waves of data collection over a six year period. And then what happened during the pandemic period in, in red and also for happiness, a clear kind of downward trend. So it does look as if um, there is a, you know, a, a, a genuine, and you might think this is blindingly obvious that people have got more upset, but it's good to see that, um, you know, that this is not due to other factors that uh, could be confounding the data. <clears throat> so we see these changes in these positive states, but one thing we've been interested in is, you know, whether they're as bad or as good as the uh, changes in negative states. Um, so what we've uh, done, Eleonora, Job, and I, is to carry, is to do some standardized regression coefficients for different outcomes. <clears throat> so what this slide shows is the change between 2018-19, our reference level, <clears throat> and then late in the pandemic, that's November, December 2020, for these different markers. And we've changed the direction of these. So a positive score always means worse. And what this shows in our hands among these older people is that depression had the largest uh, deterioration. Then came life satisfaction and poor quality of life, and then deterioration and happiness. And the loneliness effect, although it's significant, is rather lower than the other ones. So although you know, we can say that positive well-being is being impaired, um, it seems uh, certainly in this data set not quite as much as um, uh, a, a major kind of measure of negative well-being such as depression. The other interesting aspect as far as these um, positive states are concerned is relationship with other factors and the particular one I want to highlight is socioeconomic status or um, as defined in our sample by wealth. We can do this with um, education, we can do this with income, but among older people, many of whom are retired, we believe that wealth is a better indicator because it gives a better indicator of socioeconomic resources. So what I've shown here are the two, two measures I've been focusing on, happiness and life satisfaction here, uh, before the pandemic and then during the pandemic. Uh, averaged across the two time points there, uh, divided out according to thirds of the uh, population. So this line in blue are the poorest group, and then the next poorest, and then the uh, wealthiest group. And what you can see is a very striking socioeconomic gradient, but not the sort that we're usually used to, where the <coughs> poorer people do worse. The poorer people are worse all the way through, but they're not actually responding nearly so much to the pandemic as our more affluent groups. Um, and it's them who are showing this decline, um, whereas the, uh, the, the decline in life satisfaction and happiness among the, the, the poorest turtle is relatively small here or almost non-existent as far as um, happiness ratings are concerned. So why might this be? Um, I suppose the, the way we think about this is that perhaps people who have less money uh, don't need the kind of uh, activities which have been curtailed during the pandemic uh, in order to uh, maintain their life satisfaction and happiness. They maybe don't have the disposal income which allows them to go out and about, to go on vacation, to do all sorts of things that they had previously done. And it's the more affluent people who are suffering more in that respect. Uh, but it's interesting because what this is suggesting is a kind of compression, if you like, of the socioeconomic gradient. And one reason why that's interesting is that there are data certainly from, uh, from the economic domain, uh, certainly in Europe, I don't know in the US, of a shrinking of socioeconomic gradients during the pandemic and a smaller uh, differentiation between um, more affluent, uh, higher SES and lower SES groups. And in the economic area, that's thought to be due to two things. One is that in most European countries, poor people, poorer people, um, um, lower SES people have had income support schemes put in uh, to help keep, keep up their position. And secondly, that um, some of the more affluent people are self-employed, and so they've uh, been particularly suffering uh, because, of the, um, uh, because of the pandemic. 
or they've been sent home uh, and they're not able to work. So it's interesting that this, this kind of compression uh, seems to be taking place. Okay, the point I wanted to move on to now is talking about uh, resilience a bit and uh, uh, that our kind of approach to that issue. So as you'll all know, there are many different ways of construing and defining resilience, whether you look at it in terms of uh, people who show um, adaptation, positive adaptations, despite uh, all sorts of uh, uh, adversity they've had, uh, or various types of resilience questionnaire, which um, try to focus on the extent to which people um, uh, you know, are, are able to bounce back from various kinds of adversity. What we've been thinking about more is um, kind of purpose and uh, living a worthwhile life and uh, the possibility that that might be contributing to resilience during this period. Um, I'm not going to go into the sort of background of this in a lot of detail, but when we think about meaning, um, as many of you will know, there are many different ways of defining that in terms of the sense of coherence, the sense of existential significance, but also sense of purpose, which obviously people, um, Laura and others at Harvard have worked a, a lot uh, in, in that area. And in particular, we've been interested in the um, issue of whether people feel they're doing worthwhile things in their lives. And the reason why we're interested in this is that we have published a couple of papers in this area before the pandemic, um, which suggested that uh, people's sense that they were doing worthwhile things in their lives seemed to be associated with a variety of favorable outcomes. This is a paper that uh, we published in 2019. Um, and uh, what uh, we did in this study, I'll describe, uh, briefly describe it. It was an outcome-wide analysis we did uh, in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, using this question, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? And what we found, first of all, is as you might expect, there's a whole series of cross-sectional associations with different factors. Um, so that's illustrated here in the health domain, where what I've done is plotted four outcomes, uh, the extent to which people's self-rated health is fair or poor compared with good or very good, the extent of limiting uh, illness, the extent of a series of eight different chronic illnesses, and then uh, the proportion of people who have uh, depressive symptoms. And on the horizontal axis in each um, graph here, I've divided out our 10 point worthwhile rating into five categories. So these are the highest people and those are the lowest. And you can see that there are gradients in all these uh, um, factors related to these health outcomes. What was more interesting is that if we looked over longitudinally the four year period, then the worthwhile ratings seem to predict uh, differences um, in outcomes, even when we adjusted for the baseline levels. So here, for example, are the uh, proportion of people reporting fair or poor health. Uh, here is the incident chronic illnesses, new cases of diseases such as coronary heart disease or diabetes over this four year period. Uh, here is incident depression. So these are people who are getting severe depressive symptoms who didn't have them before. And then here is incident pain, people who didn't have chronic pain before and did afterwards. The gradients are much smaller in these longitudinal um, analyses, but nevertheless, they seem to be uh, present in these different characteristics. Um, and they also seem to be present in various aspects of physical capability. Here is walking speed or gait speed, when we adjust for the baseline gait speed, the people who feel they're doing more worthwhile things um, are um, walking more quickly. Um, they have fewer incident impaired activities of daily living, both instrumental and um, uh, basic activities of daily living, and uh, their sleep is better as well. And there's some evidence also about biomarkers. This is C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, white blood cell count, and um, uh, low HDL cholesterol. Now I've gone over those very quickly because those are <coughs> published results, so not necessary to discuss them in detail, but they did seem to us to suggest that this kind of marker might be interesting to look at in the COVID um, uh, domain. We did do so various analyses to see whether these things are being driven, for example, by lower socioeconomic status or by depression <coughs> or undisclosed health problems, but that didn't seem to be the case. Um, and these worthwhile ratings were also related to a, a, a variety of other aspects of 
social and personal lifestyle factors. <clears throat> so what we've done is to look at these ratings during the COVID pandemic and to see uh, what happens with that. And this is the, <clears throat> the first uh, result I'd like to show you. <clears throat> these are the results from 2018-19. These ratings are averaging just under 7.6. And then early in the pandemic and later in the pandemic, uh, with men and women separated, you can see that there's a more rapid reduction in women uh, than in men, um, though by the end of the year, both groups are showing quite substantial change. This change in men between uh, pre-COVID and June, July is actually statistically significant, but that's because it's a mammoth sample, um, but it's obviously not a very large change. And we have found that those <coughs> changes are very variable, but they're greater among people who had direct experience of COVID infection. So if people that had COVID infection in their household or in their family and their friends, um, <coughs> if their financial situation deteriorated, if they have difficulty in getting to services like going to the pharmacy, going to shops, then they had more problems. But what we're interested in is whether there were certain characteristics which led to a kind of preservation of the sense that one was leading a, a worthwhile life, that one was doing uh, meaningful things in one's life. And so we were thinking about the different sorts of factors that might be contributing there. And two, um, we've been very interested in which stand out. <coughs> One is what we call being a key worker, which I think maybe is called an essential worker in the US. Um, so early on in the pandemic, various people were defined as being essential uh, workers. These are people uh, in the health and service sector, health and social care sector, but also people working on utilities such as gas and electricity, people working in transportation, um, people who were, um, you know, filling the shops, uh, the, the, the shelves and shops, all those sorts of things. So not just high status jobs, but quite a number of uh, other types of job. And what you can see here is a clear distinction between the changes in thinking one's doing worthwhile things in these people who are key workers compared with not key workers. The not key workers are showing this deterioration, uh, which um, you can see is adjusted for various other factors, whereas the key workers showed a small improvement um, that they did feel that they were doing worthwhile things. Now, it's likely people in the healthcare and service uh, sectors may already think they're doing worthwhile things, but you know, it may be that some of the people in lower status uh, important jobs, you know, the, the sense of worth of their activities might have been enhanced during this period because people realized that these are really important people to keep the uh, society going. The other group who seem to show a preservation of uh, this sense of uh, doing meaningful things uh, was um, volunteers, and in particular people who were able to carry on volunteering during the pandemic. What I've shown here are three groups, uh, people who never were not volunteers at all, uh, people who <clears throat> had volunteered during, uh, previously in 2018-19, some of whom stopped volunteering and others who were able to continue. And you can see that the <coughs> reduction in uh, feeling you're doing worthwhile things was much greater in the people who had stopped uh, volunteering uh, compared with uh, others. So I think there are some interesting characteristics which are related to this or preservation of sense ones leading, uh, doing meaningful things, which might be helpful as far as being uh, resilient is concerned. And in order to test that, what we've done is to look at how these changes in ratings in, uh, in life uh, early in the pandemic, that's in June and July last year, relate to later adaptation. So are the people who show this uh, bigger deterioration or so preservation of um, uh, their worthwhile ratings, do they differ in outcomes uh, later on? And so what we did here was to look at the exposure, which was the change in these worthwhile ratings uh, over this time period, and then looked at different um, outcomes. So I'm presenting these results in terms of categorical um, findings, um, just dividing the group up into people who decreased their worthwhile ratings, people who showed no change or very little change, and those people who showed uh, an improvement, um, but we actually analyze this as uh, continuous scores. And so you can see the three groups uh, here uh, up, up at the top are the um, proportion of people who are scoring above threshold on the CESD. Down here, 
are anxiety measures using the GAD7. And so these are absolute scores on the GAD7. But these are all adjusted for the anxiety early in the pandemic. So what we're looking at here is what the depression anxiety is like late in the year, even when we take account of what it was like earlier in the year. And the people who showed the improvement in, um, uh, in the sense that they're doing worthwhile things have lower levels of depression. They have lower levels of anxiety uh, later on in the pandemic, suggesting, I think, quite strongly that that, that is uh, buffering uh, the, uh, the positive, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the impact of the pandemic. And we also show a similar sort of thing when we look at the um, typo there, worthwhile ratings um, in happiness uh, and in life satisfaction. So that the people who um, showed an improvement, an increase in worthwhile ratings have higher levels of life satisfaction later in the year, even when we adjust for the life satisfaction they had earlier on in the pandemic. So I think that this might be an interesting way to, to think about um, the uh, resilience or the individual differences that could be important in determining how well, how effectively people uh, cope with this situation. And um, it will be interesting to see whether these same patterns persist uh, into the next year or so where we hope that things will get better. So I was going to talk about time use, but I think in the interest of time, it's probably better to stop there. So I know we have a, a, a time uh, um, a constraint on this uh, uh, talk, and I'd rather hear people's comments on this. Um, so I will uh, um, drop that part of my presentation and just, of course, uh, mention my uh, collaborators who've been involved in this work and uh, uh, very helpful and uh, valuable their work has been. And thank you very much for listening. All right. Well, thank you so much. What a lot of information. <laughs> Although we have someone in the chat, Suzanne Zagerstrom, who's saying, but I wanted to hear about time use. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to go back to it if you have to, if you want to. But, uh, uh, is there a, a it's, summary it's just point? A it's just a couple of slides. I can just show sure, you. Sure, go ahead. We'll, we'll All right, uh, see okay. if we can squeeze it in. So what we did in looking at time use was to try to look at quite a sort of molecular level of time use uh, by doing a kind of lagged analysis. We had these weekly assessments that, uh, during our, uh, in our um, uh, COVID-19 social study, and we did an analysis over the early periods of the um, pandemic, um, where we were analyzing 55,000 people, and what the people provided were weekly assessments of life satisfaction and depression, uh, I'll show you, and also what they did yesterday. And so we're doing a fixed effect analysis, uh, trying to see uh, whether uh, using time in different ways was related to subsequent well-being after controlling for the kind of um, contemporaneous well-being. So what we're looking at here is whether an activity in week one adjusting for depression at that time is related to later depression on week two, if you see what I mean. And to cut a long story short, um, these were the factors which were predictors of increased life satisfaction. So people who on one week said that they'd been volunteering, which you wouldn't be surprised from what I've heard already, but also gardening <coughs> and exercising uh, showed an increase in life satisfaction over on the next week. Um, whereas uh, other factors predicted a reduction in life satisfaction, one of which was working. So people who are working more than three hours um, in the previous day, the following week were less satisfied. Following COVID-19 news was very bad news, which is of course very bad for all of us who <laughs> tend to be glued to the television and to the radio and the internet all the time about this, but it didn't seem to have done anyone any, any good. And more time looking after children um, in one week was related to a lower life satisfaction the week after. And this may well be to do with not the kind of habitual looking after the children, but the kind of enforced looking after children, which people had to do um, early uh, in the early months of the pandemic when they were locked down and children were staying at home. So people who were uh, spending a great deal of time looking after their children the following week uh, were pretty annoyed. Uh, so that's in a nutshell is what we found. Wow, that's bad news for all of us working more than three hours. <laughs> 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 Seriously, like we're in trouble, I think all of us. 
But um, well, I think I think I think remember this was early on in the pandemic, and many people saw it as a bit like an extended holiday at the time. You I know, see. They could stay at home, they didn't have to work, you know, and then but some work on their work. sourdough bread. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Baking was done in this country a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to open it up for questions, and um, people can go ahead and put them in the chat. And while I'm waiting for folks to kind of gather their thoughts, I have a question I'll pose to you, Andrew. So the findings on um, volunteering are striking in terms of the relationship between folks who are volunteering and then um, improving their sense of life worthwhile and so forth. And I, my question to you is about using that as an intervention or modifiability. So, you know, the people who generally are in better mental health tend to be more willing to volunteer. So if you take someone who's sort of already not in great mental health and they're like, no, you have to volunteer. Do you think that that would have the same kind of improvements or, you know, like, so how useful is that as a lever, let's say for modifying well-being? I think that's very tricky for exactly the reason that you're saying that it's, there's a selection, a strong selection process going on here with people being willing to volunteer in the first place. Uh, and that's why we were comparing the, the people who had previously volunteered with those who hadn't, um, with, with those who, um, you know, had to stop during that time period. So whether you, you know, were encouraging volunteering, um, you know, I think, you know, there are studies such as uh, Tara Grunwald's studies with the pioneer groups, um, which, you know, have, have looked at this in a more uh, systematic way. Um, so um, there may be something there, but I, I think it has to be done quite in quite a subtle way, I think. Okay, well, we now have a lot of questions coming into the chat and a lot of them are actually around loneliness. So let me pose um, a couple of these. One is um, asking about if you could comment on the lack of change in loneliness during the COVID study. So I think lots of people will find that surprising because this was certainly a talking point that a lot of us heard was how this was going to dramatically increase loneliness. And then there are some um, related questions um, about characterizing the loneliness. But maybe let's start with that one and we'll come back to these other ones. Yes. Well, I should say, first of all, that definitely loneliness went up. I mean, I think most of the data sets show that and our, our longitudinal data set uh, shows that as well. Uh, but what it didn't seem to do is to go up maybe quite as much as some of the other uh, factors. So whether over time during these periods of you know, restriction, social restriction, people were able to start engaging in other forms of communication more effectively, that uh, helped ameliorate their, their loneliness, I think is quite an interesting um, issue. We're actually just doing some work now on uh, looking at the extent to which people, you know, were using remote forms of contact more during the time period of the pandemic. Uh, and it could be that, you know, the initial feel for loneliness you know, is different from, from, you know, what happened over the longer term. But certainly in this country, the, the loneliness issue has been very much uh, focused on younger people. Remember that most of the data I'm showing is on, on older people, and there have been a lot of complaints among younger people um, that they are lonely, partly, I suspect, because they're used to a kind of um, getting their relationships from outside the household and from going out and about. So when they weren't able to do that, uh, then their, their loneliness um, would have increased. Whereas loneliness in older people is a slightly different thing. I think it's sort of driven I, I think a bit more by you know changes because of parents dying maybe partners dying all sorts of things which are, are, are very different from the kind of experience of younger people uh, and maybe not things that necessarily um, fluctuate it quite as much. Yeah that's interesting a lot a lot to think about there. Um, I have a couple other questions on the loneliness so one question about whether um, loneliness was related to health compliance behaviors and then a Another question um, on whether you were able to compare those who were most and least lonely to see if they differed in interesting ways other than by socioeconomic status and gender. So one is sort of the, you know, sort of products of loneliness in terms of health behaviors and the other are the antecedents, like how do these folks maybe differ? Yes, I mean, we've, we, we've looked quite a number of the factors related to loneliness, but I think as I, one of the earlier slides suggested that the, the in, in our findings, the, the patterns are not hugely different from what, you know, has been found 
previously in relation to loneliness, employed people are less lonely. Um, people who live alone are more lonely. You know, those sorts of things, which uh, are nothing particularly to, so much to do with the COVID pandemic, though they may be accentuated, obviously, by the lack of, uh, uh, of, of social contact. So I think um, we, we haven't so far shown anything very striking uh, about those things, though I, we are looking at it a bit more now to try and understand that. And one of the things we're quite interested in at the moment is um, how loneliness relates to internet use, which obviously is, you know, has, has generally been an issue of both positive and negative association seen uh, with uh, internet use. But in particular, thinking about the types of use, you know, what sort of reasons people are going onto the internet and whether there are some uh, differences there um, sort of when you think about the more sort of pro-social aspects of internet use compared with the other um, uh, things such as looking at COVID news, which, as I said, is not good. <laughs> and then, sorry, did you speak to whether they were related to health compliance behaviors, loneliness was? Um, I didn't, and that's because I just can't remember what the result is on that. But if, if someone wants to send me an email, I can... I, th I think we have published a paper on that, but I, to be honest, I just can't remember what the result is just off, off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Okay, um, this next question is one I think, um, I suspect you'll be able to answer, at least if not with COVID data, then with something else. Have any quantitative studies looked at pet ownership and listening to music as predictors of better mental health? Uh, yes, there have been studies of, of both those things. Um, in our hands in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, we completely failed to find an association between pet ownership and well-being. Uh, in you know, we tried up upside down, you know, every single way, and we couldn't uh, find an association. And I suspect that's because pet ownership itself is quite a variable experience. Um, I, mean, I know some people like Laura love their dogs, but some people find their dogs <laughs> maddening. Um, we, we, in our system, I don't know what you have in the US, when, <clears throat> when we're looking at this in our longitudinal study, we ask people if they have dogs and cats, and then we ask them if they have other furry animals, and then we ask them if they have anything else. Um, so, you know, if you have a stick insect or a, you know, a reptile sort of thing, stuff like that. And it's surprising how many people have these other furry and things like that. But, um, you know, the main uh, focus of the work on pets has more been to do with exercise um, and not so much to do with the, um, uh, the emotional support. But, you know, you talk to anyone who's got a dog or a cat and they will tell you that it does provide important emotional support as well. So I'm not quite sure why our data uh, are not able to show that. Um, what was the other thing I talked from pets? Sorry, I, I forgot. Uh, it was words. if listening to music is a good predictor of mental health. Yeah, well, we did uh, in our that sort of that that last time use um, analysis, we did include um, um, listening to music as one of the one of the factors, uh, one of the um, the variables we tested, but we didn't actually see any association over this, these kind of time periods. But remember what we were looking at there is kind of changes over time. So you could have a steady state, which we were not really looking at. What we were looking at is whether on week, a particular week someone's listening to a lot more music, whether that would then be uh, impacting on their well-being uh, the following week. Yeah, it's interesting too, because you know, I, if I were gonna guess, I would guess that making music would probably be a stronger predictor. But of course in COVID, any, any ability to make music socially, right, has, was shut down, or you had to have some yeah, special amazing social. software to make it happen yeah. when you Zoom, so, yeah. You could still whistle. <laughs> yes. That's true, you can play your ukulele by yourself at home, so <laughs> exactly. that's always fun. Um, all right, and then we have Jen Lerner who says, thanks for the talk, could your data speak to people working in the healthcare se sector specifically? Presumably nurses would have felt a heightened sense of purpose and meaning during the pandemic, and yet we are hearing reports of massive burnout. Well, I think both things are true. We actually, um, if, if whoever it is would like to contact me, we have a, a, a qualitative paper, an interesting qualitative paper on interviews with health professionals. Uh, which express both things, you know, the extreme distress associated with, you know, dealing with these terrible, sad situations, 
the frustration of the difficulties in getting the health system working properly and getting access to PPE and so on, but also the sense of, of doing worthwhile things, you know, being, um, uh, you know, uh, being praised by the public. In, in the UK, we had a period over uh, the summertime, uh, uh, you know, from about May till September, where every Thursday evening at eight o'clock in the morning, everyone, eight o'clock in the evening, everyone went outside their house and applauded for the health workers. And so people were doing this right around the country and, you know, children coming out and making banners and so on. So there was a great deal of very public sort of uh, acknowledgement uh, of, um, uh, of, of their contributions, which will have reinforced that, um, you know, that sense of worthwhile. But whether it really balanced the, you know, the pressure they were under, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, that's interesting. And we have some data that we haven't published yet that we've been looking at, though, where we are finding among healthcare workers a surprising um, um, policy resilience, like the mental health seems to be remarkably good over this very intense period, but um, with some important age differences. So much stronger among older adults, whereas the younger healthcare workers seem to be having a much harder time. Um, yeah. in, in our data. It's not published yet, but that's some of our informal findings. So I, I think yeah. the age issue during COVID was a big one in terms of how people are Definitely. impacted. Yeah. And, and we have found in a lot of our data that the older folks have been doing much better, which was not what people, I think, originally were expecting. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, okay. Maybe we'll just take this one more question and then wrap up. So somebody wanted to know if your loneliness was measured unidimensionally or if it was split into emotional uh, and social loneliness. Uh, we were just using the UCLA short scale, which is only the three items. And so we haven't tended to divide that out, unfortunately, but that would be a very interesting uh, issue because one might well predict some differences. Uh, related in particular to social loneliness, of course, um, yeah. in this area. So it's a very nice question, but unfortunately we don't have the data. All right, well, thank you all. I'm mindful of time and I wanna say a very hearty thanks to Andrew for this wonderful talk and really comprehensive and amazing ability to collect data on the moment, in the moment on, you know, to address really um, important issues. Um, and then I just want to mention to folks that our next seminar is going to be on Wednesday, December 15th. Um, and we have Dr. Cindy Liu, who's the Director of Developmental Risk and Cultural Resilience Laboratory at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And her research is focusing on culture and socio-emotional development, race ethnic disparities as they relate to maternal and child health. And, and she has actually been very involved in an ongoing um, tracking of uh, mental health among young adults during COVID. So I think it'll be a really interesting talk to this issue of, you know, understanding how these factors are playing out both in younger and older adults. So I hope we'll get to see many of you there as well. And thanks again for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks so much, Laura. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.